<clears throat> Alright, you probably clicked on this video because you want to learn how to create a malware from scratch. Well, by the end of this video, you'll have the knowledge to create your first one. But why are you so interested in such thing? Is it curiosity? Is it that you want to hack someone? Huh? Well, in case it's the latter, a disclaimer. All knowledge and techniques explained in this video are for educational purposes only, and I'm not responsible for any misuse or abuse of it. Before we proceed, I would like to introduce someone to you. Everyone, this is Sad. What's up, everyone? My assistant for this video. Sad will help me explain terminologies and concepts of various stuff throughout the video. If you want, you can skip to the malware development part, or you can stick around and learn the core concepts of malware. So, first things first, why would we even develop malware? It seems so illegal, right? Well, as reverse engineers or hackers in general, we need to understand what's happening under the hood. Any engineering process is all about building something from point A to point Z. The process that resides in between is what's important to us. We're standing at point Z and we want to go all the way back to point A. If we do not understand the engineering process that happened in between, it'll be a waste of time for us. TLDR? You cannot reverse engineer what you do not understand. This is reverse engineering in a nutshell. Now, let's discuss some terminologies and concepts. If we open the task manager in Windows, we will see a list of running programs. These programs are also known as processes. And there are two types of processes. These are move processes and system processes, which are part of the operating system that has the highest privileges. Now, if we open an awesome tool like Process Hacker, we can see each process has a unique identifier associated with it. This unique identifier is called PID or Process Identifier. This PID is so crucial to us because we use it to get a handle to a process. Using this handle, we can do pretty much anything we want with this process, such as allocating memory, modifying the privileges of certain pages in memory. Basically, we can manipulate this process however we want. Another concept we need to be familiar with is the layout of memory and how it works. The memory consists of multiple blocks. These blocks are called pages. Each page has certain properties such as size or range of addresses, security flags or execution permissions like read, write and execute, and the page type that in the case of a page is committed or reserved or even both. We'll get back to page types later in the video. Now, for a 32-bit process, all memory addresses have maximum size of 4 bytes, or a D word. A word is 2 bytes. A D word, or double word, is 4 bytes. A Q word, or quad word, is 8 bytes. For a 64-bit process, everything is the same except for the size of the addresses. Each memory address can have a maximum size of 8 bytes or a Q word. Make sure to take a minute and try to memorize these type definitions, because we're going to be using them a lot during our malware development. Now, shellcode. What the hell is a shellcode? In the simplest terms, shellcode is just assembly code that achieves a specific purpose. You can think of it as a payload that executes, for example, a shell command, or a reverse shell, or even pops a simple message box. For example, the shellcode in this binary file executes message box. If we open a hex editor, we can see some printable strings such as kernel 32dio message box, and our message hello world. And if we open it with a disassembler, we can see a bunch of assembly instructions. Now, a good question to ask here is why the hell would we even use any shellcode in the first place? We can just put our malicious code in a function and just call this function a runtime. Well, as malware developers, our main goal is to bypass antiviruses and ADRs and avoid detection. Creating the malware is the easy part. Avoiding detection is the cat and mouse game. Any shitty antivirus nowadays can just scan your malware for known signatures and malicious behavior such as suspicious Windows APIs and immediately flags your malware as malicious. We can't even use a plain shellcode that executes a reverse shell and just hard code in our malware. It will be flagged as malicious immediately since any antivirus has access to a huge database of signature shellcodes. Most of the time you'll have to encrypt your shellcode with some sort of a cryptographic algorithm such as RC4. In a runtime, the shellcode gets decrypted and executed. But since this video is just an introduction to malware development, we're just going to stick to the basics. And in future videos, I'm going to explain these techniques in detail. One last terminology you need to be familiar with is the freak in Windows API. 
The inner workings of the Windows operating system are so complex that you can learn nuclear physics instead. In order to reduce this complexity, Microsoft provided developers with the Windows API to help make life easier for them when developing applications for the Windows operating system. These applications can be anything from a simple console app to a phenomenal AAA video game such as Starfield. Yeah, I'm a big fan. The libraries, or rather we say the DLLs provided by the Windows API have tons of functions for literally anything. For example, using this simple Python script, we can extract the exports or the functions exported by the kernel32.dll library. We can see APIs such as virtual alloc, create remote thread, write process memory, and many more. And they all well documented on Microsoft website, which we will be referring to a lot when we start developing our malware. The Windows API also provides custom type definitions. Remember the word and dword type definitions we discussed earlier? Actually, they are part of the Windows API, along with many other type definitions. We can look up all the type definitions and what they map to on Microsoft documentations. For example, we can see that a word is defined as unsigned short, dword is defined as unsigned long, qword is defined as unsigned int64, and the list goes on. If you ever were confused by a type definition, you can always refer to this table. Now, one last thing we need to discuss regarding the Windows API is structs or structures. In C, a struct is like a container that can hold different types of data together. It's like a custom made data type that you can create to group related pieces of information. Imagine you're building a program to store information about students in a school. And instead of using separate variables for each piece of information like name, age, and grade, you can use a struct to group them together. Now, since some Windows APIs return a pointer to a structure, we need a predefined struct to store the data returned by a certain Windows API. For example, process32 first and process32 next are two Windows APIs that take in a struct called process entry32 as a second parameter. If the function succeeds, this struct gets populated by information related to a certain process like the process name and ID. In addition to the struct, there are tons of more structs that are predefined and provided by the Windows API for different use cases, without the need to define any of them. All we have to do is to include the Windows header and that's it. Everything will be ready for us. With these concepts and terminologies out of the way, now we can move on and start creating some malware. Let's start things off with self-injection. Now, some of you might be wondering what the hell is an injection technique or attack in the first place. Well, the best way to try and avoid antiviruses is to use fileless attacks. Fileless attacks are attacks that only take place in memory without writing any files to disk, without touching disk at all. We all agree that each process running has its own memory space like we discussed before. We want to take advantage of this behavior and instead of running our malicious code to disk and then executing it, we inject our malicious code or shell code somewhere in some process memory and then have this injected shell code executed. All injection attacks have three steps in common. The first step is to allocate memory for the shell code that you want to execute. Second is to write or copy the shellcode into the allocated memory. And finally, executing the shellcode. Don't worry, we'll go through each step in detail in the next part. Just take a moment, stretch, get a drink, and let's see everything in action. All right, so, and this, co hey, Seth, what the hell is this? Where's the code? What code? The code that I told you to write for the video. You didn't tell me to write any code. You mother f Sorry about that. God, this guy's a mess. Anyways, let's first talk about self-injection. In this code, we have two header files included. Header files in C are files that contain predefined functions, structs, nooms, and a lot more, just like we discussed in the Windows API earlier. You can think of a header file in C as when you import a module in Python that extends your code and gives you more functionality. Here we have the Windows header file included. You can always take a look inside any header file by holding control and then click on the header file. By the way, I'm using Visual Studio 2022 Community Edition. You can get it from the Microsoft official website. Now, inside the Windows header file, you'll find a lot of if diffs and tons of other header files included. Basically, the Windows header acts as a wrapper around the Windows API or a container that has everything already included and ready to use. Instead of having to include each header separately and make your code looks ugly. So to avoid that, you just include the Windows header file and it's a happy life. 
then the stdio header file is just for input and output operations we just include it to be able to print strings or read and write stuff to the console now in the main function we first define our shell code that we want to execute this is just a simple shell code to execute a message box if you want to create your own shell code you have three options if you have a good knowledge in assembly you can create your own from scratch i'll be making a special video on this later the second option is to grab your desired shell code from sites like shellstorm or exploit db or if you have kali linux installed you can use the metasploy framework run msf console and then type use payload windows and if you want the shell code to be for x64 architecture type x64 we'll stick to x86 architecture for this video since we don't want to complicate things up we can see here tons of shell codes we can generate such as meterpreter sessions reverse shells and many more we're just going to stick to a simple message box shell code for proof of concept. Once you select the message box shell code, type show options and then set your custom message and title. And then type generate. If you're having trouble using MSF console, you can generate the same shell code with MSF Venom by running this command. And make sure to include a dash FC flag to output the shell code in C format. Once the shell code is generated, copy it to Visual Studio and make sure the architecture is set to x86 not x64 to make the executable compatible with the shell code. Now, here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 Windows APIs that make all the functionality for the self-injection technique. So, I think the best way to have a deeper understanding for the functionality of each API is to visualize what's really happening behind the scenes in the memory when each API is executed, instead of just explaining what each API does. So. Imagine this is the memory map of our process. I know it's a crabby map, but just imagine. The code in our main function is loaded somewhere in this memory map. Let's say it's here, for example. Now, the first API executed is virtual alloc. Remember, we first need to allocate memory for our shell code, and we use virtual alloc for that. This API takes four parameters. First parameter is the base address of the block of memory that we want to allocate. Since we don't know exactly where should we allocate this block of memory, we'll let the operating system do that for us by setting this parameter as null. The second parameter is how much memory we want to allocate. Since we want to allocate enough space for our shell code, we'll just do that by setting the size of the allocated memory to the size of our shell code. Third parameter is the allocation type. According to Microsoft documentations, if we want to reserve and commit pages in one call, we should use the mem commit and mem reserve flags together. Well, I know we should do what the docs say, but what exactly are these mem commit and mem reserve flags and what does this pipeline symbol represent? When we want to allocate a page or block of memory, we first need to reserve it. That's why we use the mem reserve flag. Then after we reserve it, we need to commit it. Committing just telling the operating system that we want to read and write to this block of memory. So we use the mem commit flag for that. In plain English, we're telling the operating system, hey, we want to reserve this block of memory, so here's the reservation flag. And then we want to read and write to this block of memory as well, so here's the commit flag. Basically, we cannot read and write to a block of memory unless we reserve it first. Now, in order to use both of these flags together, we use the pipeline or the logic or symbol to add them up, since this symbol represents the logic or operation. If we hold control and click on this mem commit flag, we can see that it maps to a numerical value of hex 1000. These all caps flag are called enums. Enums in C are data types defined by the user that map to numerical values. So in here we can see the mem commit flag maps to hex 1000 and mem reserve maps to hex 2000. Now, since we want to use both of these flags together, we have to add them up. And for that, we use the logic or simple, since the or logic gate simulates the submission behavior. Now, if we OR both of these numbers together, we get hex 3000, which indicates that this memory page has the reserve and commit flag set. We can even replace these flags with hex 3000 and our code will work just fine. Pretty neat, right? The last parameter is the protection flags for the memory page. Since we want to read, write and execute code in this memory page, we set the page execute read, write flag. And again, to see the numerical value that this new maps to, hold control and click on it. You can see the maps to hex 40, which you can hard code if you want. If the virtual alloc runs successfully, it will return a void pointer to the base address or the start address of the allocated memory page. We all know that pointers are variables that store addresses which point to some data types in memory. We can have a pointer points to literally any data type in memory such as an integer or a char array. A void pointer on the other hand is just a pointer to an undefined data type in memory, hence the term void. The void pointer returned by the virtual alloc API is defined as LP void, which stands 
stands for long pointer to void. If we see the type definition for this LP void data type, we can see it's set to void far, which is a void pointer in a nutshell. Now, again, the virtual arc API returned a void pointer because there's no data written in this memory page yet. You can always check the type definition of any Windows API whenever you feel like it, because Microsoft has a shitty time coming up with good names for their type definitions. F Microsoft! Okay. F Anyways, the second step now is to write our shell code to the allocated memory. So in the RTL copy memory API, we copy or write our shell code to the allocated memory. The RTL copy memory API has the same functionality as the mem copy function. But since we're working with the Windows API, we use a Windows based memory API, which is RTL copy memory. It takes in three parameters the destination or where to write to, the source or where to read from, and the size of the copied data, which is set to the size of our shellcode. The final step is to execute our shellcode using the create thread API. This API takes in six parameters. We're only interested in the third parameter, which is the entry point for the created thread. Threads are individual units of execution within a process, and sometimes referred to as lightweight processes, because they share the same memory space and resources of the parent process, but they have their own program counter, stack, and registers. This allows them to run concurrently and perform tasks independently within the same process. Imagine that you have a program that consists of three functions, and each function takes one second to finish execution. This means the program will take three seconds to finish execution. Using threads, we can create three threads to execute each function in parallel, and hence reduce the execution time to one second. This is the general idea of threading and concurrency. Now, this third parameter is set to the start address of our shellcode and typecasted to LB thread start routine. Basically, what's happening here is that when we typecast this memory address with this typecast, we're telling the operating system, hey, this is the entry point or the start address that we want the created thread to start execution from, or this is the start of the code that must be executed when the thread is created. If the thread created successfully, the API will return a handle to the created thread. A handle is yet another void pointer to the created thread. Now, since we don't want to terminate our program until our shellcode is finished execution, we will pause or halt the execution here using the wait for single object API. This API takes in two parameters, the thread handle and the amount of time we want to wait for until the program resumes execution. Since we want to completely halt the execution until the thread returns or finishes execution, we set it to infinite. And after the thread returns and our shell code is executed, we free up the allocated memory using virtual free. Now, again, when I run this program now, a memory page with the size of our shellcode will be allocated with the allocation types of memcommit and memreserve, and we'll have the read, write, and execute flags set. Then our shellcode will be written or copied into the allocated memory. Then a thread will be created to execute the shellcode, and the execution will halt until the thread returns or the shellcode is executed. And finally, the handle will be closed to the thread, and the allocated memory will be freed. And then the program terminates. Congratulations. Cool stuff. Now, let's confirm that our shellcode is injected into our process by checking the memory map using our awesome process hacker tool. We know from our program that the base address of our memory page starts at this address, and we can find it easily here. And if you notice, the protection for the memory page is set to read, write, and execute, which is what we specify in our program. Reading the injected shellcode, we can see our message, which is shellcode by MSF Venom, same as in the message box. But it's kinda upside down due to the Indianus, since bytes or data is stored in little Indian in memory, which makes it kinda reversed or upside down. And if you still don't believe me, you can compare the injected shellcode to our hard-coded shellcode, and you'll find that they match exactly. Told ya, it's legit. Nice. Alright, so far so good. Now, let's get a bit nerdier and upgrade this self-injection technique to process injection. In self-injection, we injected our shellcode into the memory space of our creative process. The same thing will be done in process injection, the only difference is that we will inject our shellcode into the memory space of another running process. Let's say we're going to inject into Microsoft Paint. Since Microsoft Paint is a 64-bit process, we have to use a 64-bit shellcode. So back here in Kali, we run the same MSF Venom command and add the dash A flag for architecture and set it to x64. Once the shellcode is generated, copy it to Visual Studio and make sure to set the build architecture to x64 for compatibility. Now, in self-injection, we have three steps. Allocate memory, write our shellcode to the allocated memory, 
and create a thread to execute the injected shell code. In process injection, we'll do the same exact steps, but first we have to add one more step, which is to first get a handle to the process that we want to inject our shell code into. Again, you can think of this process handle as a door we use to get into the memory space of this process. And once we do that, we can do the same exact three steps as before. Now, in order to get a handle to the process that we want to inject our shell code into, we use the open process API. This API takes in three parameters, the desired access to process object or the access rights we want to have over the process. Since we want to access all process resources, we use the process all access flag. The second parameter takes in a boolean value and we set it to true if we want to make the chai processes created by our process inherit this handle. And since we're not going to create any chai processes, we set it to false. The third parameter and the most important one is the process ID which we want to access. This process ID can be obtained by opening a tool like process hacker and grabbing the process ID from there. This is what will be done each time we open the process that we want to inject into. Since the operating system assigns a different process ID to the same program each time it's executed, which is kind of a bummer. But since we're pro hackers, we're not going to open process hacker every time to get the PID for the process that we want to inject into. Instead, we're going to take a snapshot of all running processes. If the term snapshot kind of confuses you, you can think of it as taking a screenshot of all running processes and then we loop through each process and check its name. If it matches the process we want, we obtain its PID and other information related to it. So in the code here, we first define the process entry 32 struct which will store information related to each process in a snapshot. Then we set the size member to the size of the whole structure. And to understand how the size of a struct is calculated, you can imagine for example a struct of 4 elements, 3 D words and char array of 28 bytes. Since a D word is 4 bytes in size and we have 3, that means we have a a total of 12 bytes of D words plus 28 bytes for the char array we get a total size of 40 bytes this is basically the math done by this function here it's all about getting the size of each member in a struct and adding them up together again if the concept of a struct confuses you go back to the windows api part in which we discussed structs in detail next we have create tool help 32 snapshot api which takes in two parameters. A current Microsoft, the first parameter is the portions of the system to be included in the snapshot. Since we want to include all processes in the system in the snapshot, we'll use the DH32 CS snap process flag. The second parameter is supplied if we're using any of these flags. And since we're not, we'll set it to zero. Keep in mind that these APIs are part of the Windows API, but not included in the Windows header. So we need to include that TL help 32 header to access their definitions. Now, in order to enumerate the processes in the snapshot, we have to use two APIs process 32 first and then process 32 next and no you cannot use process 32 next only without using process 32 first before that both of these processes take in two parameters the processes snapshot and a pointer to process entry 32 struct and in a do while loop we enumerate all processes using process 32 next and compare the executable file name with mspaint.exe or microsoft paint the function WCS compare compares two Y strings together, and if they match, the return value is zero. The Windows operating system uses UTF-16 encoding to encode strings. That means each character takes up 16 bits of space in memory, or two bytes. For example, if we want to encode the string malware using UTF-16 encoding, it will be represented as follows. Notice here that each character is separated by a null byte, but this is not the case. Since each character takes up two bytes of space, we will have to pad the remaining byte with a zero to fill up the remaining byte. And then the string ends with a null byte to indicate end of string. So the string malware when stored in memory will be represented like this, hence the term wide string. So in this function here, the exe file member is a wire string, which cannot be compared with this normal string. So we prefix it with an uppercase L to tell the compiler to convert this normal string to a wire string before doing the comparison. So to recap, we first use the create tool help 32 snapshot API to get a snapshot of all running processes. And then we use process 32 first and process 32 next to enumerate them. And then we check the exe file member in the process entry 32 struct and see if it matches mspain.exe. If so, we get a handle to this process using its process ID. And then the same steps we did in the self injection technique will be done here. We use virtual alloc ex to allocate a memory page inside the memory space of Microsoft Paint. Virtual alloc ex extends the functionality of virtual alloc so that we can allocate memory inside memory space of other processes. 
It takes in the same parameters as virtual alloc. The only difference is that the first parameter is the handle to the process in which we want to allocate memory. After the memory is allocated, we use the write process memory API to write our shell code into the allocated memory inside Microsoft Paint process. This API takes in five parameters. The handle to the Microsoft Paint process, a source to copy or read from, a destination to write to, the size of the copied data, and the number of bytes read if the function succeeds. We don't really care about that, so we'll set it to null. Finally, we create a thread to execute the injected shell code using create remote thread API which takes in the same parameters as create thread in addition to the handle to the Microsoft Paint process. And similar to what we did before, we hold the execution of the program until the thread returns, and then we free the allocated memory in Microsoft Paint. And finally, we close the handles to the thread and to the process respectively, and break out of the loop. Now, let's run and see some magic. And again, we can look out the address of the allocated memory page in the memory map of Microsoft Paint using Process Hacker. We can see that this memory page has our shellcode injected into it, along with the read, write, and execute permissions. Awesome. I was also planning to explain DLL injection, what is a DLL in the first place, and all of that, but the video is getting really long and it takes forever to edit too, so we'll leave that for the next video. You can find all the code on my GitHub link in the description below. And I also have a homework for you. I want you to do the same process injection in Notepad with a different shell code. And let me know if you were able to do that or not. Finally, please give a huge applause to Sed, who didn't do anything at all throughout the video. I did all the explanation, all the coding, everything. You didn't help in any way at all. You know what? You're fired. F you. F you. So yeah, that's it everyone. Thanks a lot for... Yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching and dying. <laughs> Stop. Stop. <laughs> Stop weeping. <laughs> All right, I'll give you back your job, but under one condition. Since you ruined this video, if it gets more than 10,000 views, you'll have your job back. And that's it. <laughs> if you made it this far, thanks a lot for watching. I really hope that I was able to help you develop a deeper understanding of malware concepts and techniques and all that cool stuff. You can support the channel by giving this video a thumbs up and sharing it with your friends and whoever might be interested. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe so that we can hit 10k subs as soon as possible. You can also check out our Patreon or become a member here. I'm also now on Twitter. I mean X, not Twitter, not the bluebird, just X. I'm on X. You can follow me there. Link in the description below. So until next... Hey, Seth. What the hell are you doing? No!